Okay, good morning, everybody. Grab your notes in the back. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, as you can see, we got a little uh, f- facelift uh, over the week. Uh, the ladies did a beautiful job, so we're thankful for them to decorate for us. Um, we're going to be, uh, feels like finally moving on to the next topic in our series of, um, of soteriology, of our study of salvation. Uh, we're going to be looking at repentance today, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to try my hardest to finish repentance today because it's, it's um, I don't have that many notes. Regeneration, I probably had like t- 10 pages, 12 pages of notes, if not more. But uh, this one is only a handful of note, uh, pages of notes. So we're going to try and get through this. And then next week, Lord willing, if we get through, through repentance today, then we're going to look at faith. Because those are really two sides of the same coin. Both are the sinner's response to uh, God's regenerating work in the heart. Uh, so before we dive in, let me, let me pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Lord, we thank you uh, for weeks like this where we are given the opportunity uh, to uh, rest a bit, um, to reflect, Lord, uh, on your goodness and all the things that we are to be thankful for, Lord, there are so many good things that you have given us in the course of our lives, Lord. We have much to be thankful for, as we've been reflecting on this past week, much to be thankful for, especially your son. You have given us him. Lord, it's not just that you've given us forgiveness or that you've given us regeneration or justification, or any of these things, Lord, but the the jewel of it all is Christ himself. You've given us your son. And so, Lord, we ask that as we continue to look at this doctrine of salvation, that we would uh, repeatedly be uh, pointed back to Christ as the source and the object of it all. Lord, I pray that we would see him more clearly, see the work that he has accomplished in us, more clearly, more in detail, Lord, because as a result, uh, we, can, uh, we can worship in greater detail, as it were. So we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon this time. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're looking at repentance this morning, and uh, repentance is God's remedy for the sinner's denial and blindness. So repentance is God's remedy for the sinner's denial and blindness. We, we kind of get a hint of this from Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. It says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So we see here the state of the sinner, the state of of all of us, apart from Christ, apart from his regenerating work, he, he, he lumps it into this whole category of Gentiles, right? The people who are characteristic characteristically without God. And he says that we can live just like the Gentiles. We can live like a people that have no relationship with God. Uh, And that is uh, a futile mind, uh, darkened understanding, uh, void of the life, without life, uh, ignorant, hard-hearted, and then callous. Uh, all of these things are, you could say, internal or even uh, more specifically, uh, mental or, uh, or in, in, the, in the mind. In the mind of the sinner, there is uh, this, this futility of mind, this inability, this emptiness of mind. Uh, there is this darkened understanding 
That is, uh, no matter how they try to reach a destination, they are blind in their understanding, darkened in their understanding, and they cannot perceive reality for what it is. Of course, this comes from the fact that they are without life, without the life of God, without spiritual life, that is. They, uh, they are ignorant. That, that is, that they are uh, unknowing and not willing to learn. It's, it's both of those things in, in the biblical understanding of ignorance. Ignorance is this lack of knowledge, but coupled with this uh, willing lack of knowledge, this, this unwillingness to learn and get out of that state of the lack of knowledge. So that is, that is us. And so if that is our state, right, uh, futile in our minds, darkened in our understandings, excluded from the life of God, uh, ignorant, hard-hearted, and callous, then of course what's going to come out is, is uh, the sensuality uh, of the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness, it says there in verse 19. It's going to come out in our actions. Now, in this state, we need an external uh, power, an external force uh, to change that state of futile mind, darkened understanding, void of life, ignorant, and hard-hearted. We need something or someone to get us out of that state. And uh, that comes from God. So to get out of this state, to get out of, of, of this state, uh, that change is repentance. Repentance. It's repentance because all of these things really have to do with the mind, the thinking of the individual, right, of the sinner. So the thinking has to change. And we cannot cause that on our own. We first need regeneration to uh, change out the root, right? And then our response out of that new root, out of that new heart, is repentance, is this complete change of mind. Not only repentance, but faith as well. So when we talk about the sinner's response to regeneration, there is repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Uh, These two things, repentance and faith, cannot be separated. This is also just by way of introduction. I'm trying to get through this. This is all, uh, uh, so repentance and faith cannot be separated, right? The one who repents must believe. The one who believes must have repented um, when it comes to salvation. So repentance and faith are inseparable, but we can distinguish them. We can distinguish them. We can talk about repentance and we can talk about faith, even though they always come together in the conversion of the sinner when somebody becomes a christian both of those things are always present they must be present otherwise there is no salvation repentance and faith must be present uh, mark 1 uh, 14 and 15 says that jesus came into galilee preaching the gospel of god right evangelizing and what what is the response that he expects of them he, well, he, what he says is the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So repent and believe in the gospel. That is what's required in response to the gospel of Christ. Is repentance and belief or faith. We see this also in the preaching of the apostles. That... Um, they were solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So see what, what is testified, what is given witness to, that there must be repentance and there must be faith. Jews and Greeks alike. Nobody's excluded from this, whether you grew up in church or grew up out of the church or grew up on the street grew up in Africa, grew up in America, grew up in India, it doesn't matter where you're from, 
what your background is. Your need is repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Repentance is turning away from sin. Faith is turning towards God. So repentance is turning from sin. And faith is turning to God. It's a simple way of putting it, right? As we're going to explore when we get to faith. Uh, faith there's, there's more than just the turning towards God. There is a, a, a wholehearted reliance and belief and resting upon him. Right, But this is a simple way of putting it, turning away from sin, turning to God. That is what we are calling sinners to do. When you evangelize to the lost, to that perfect stranger or to your family member or to that friend or co-worker, that's what we are trying to, they need to know what they need to do and that, that's it. Turn away from sin, turn to God. So repentance is, you could say, the the. The negative aspect of it, right? Turn away from sin. And faith is the positive aspect, turning to God. Uh, Acts 3.19, we see this as well. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Sometimes in our evangelism, we skip a few steps, right? We just... Tell people uh, just to just to find refreshment in Jesus, or come and uh, have your your sins wiped away. But those are things that God does to us, right? Our response to God, the commands are to repent and return. Repent and return, and again, this is turning away from sin. And turning to God. That is return to God. That's what is the implication there. So repent, turn away from sin, return, have faith in God. All right? So those these are these are inseparable. I'm gonna be repeating that theme um, through this lesson and the next. But let's let's get a good idea of exactly what is repentance then. Before we get to what repentance is, we have to first distinguish, and I think it's most helpful to understand, what repentance is not. So repentance is not regret. Repentance is not regret. Matthew 27. Uh, Can somebody read uh, Matthew 27 verses 1 through Five, please, for us. Now, when the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders, the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And when they bound him, then led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then, then Judas, who betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned. He felt remorse, and he returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what, what is that to us? See to that, see to that yourself. <clears throat> and he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. And he went away and he hang, hanged himself. All right, thank you, brother. So we see Judas, right, in response to his betrayal of Christ. Uh, there seems to be uh, some would say there seems to be this, some repentance, right? He, he, he uh, responded um, to the foolishness, the sinfulness, right? He, I mean, he uses all the right words, right? I have sinned. And, and what's the sin? He betrayed innocent blood. So he understands what the sin is. Uh, but this word, when it says he felt remorse... Uh, this word is metamelomai. I'm going to try and spell it. Metamelomai. Oh, 
already AI at the end. So, meta, meta is not the metaverse. Meta is, uh, in, in its time use, in its usage in, in regards to time, it's translated after. Uh, so, in regards to time, the way it's used uh, with connected with this word, think of it as after. So after, uh, and then melomai it means to be concerned about something. So it's uh, after concern. It's a concern after the fact. When the New Testament talks about this change of mind, this is by far the weaker version, you could say. Uh, we're going to get to the other word, met, meta noel. Uh, but this one is, you could say, the weaker kind of change of mind. Uh, the, this word expresses uh, irritation or frustration over the consequences of an action. So concern after the fact. So after something has been done, for example, a sin, after a sin has been committed, uh, the concern is for, it, it comes after. And, and the best translation of this is regret. Remorse or regret. So what... what uh, Judas felt here was remorse or just regret, you could say. This word appears only five times in the Greek uh, New Testament. Um, and it's used exclusively this way as regretting or having remorse. So for, for Judas, he recognized that Jesus had been wrongly condemned and he regretted his betrayal. But... He did not find his way to genuine repentance. So this remorse or regret uh, can lead to repentance, but in and of itself is not repentance. Uh, the, the example of Judas makes that clear. Because what did he actually do with his regret or his so-called repentance what was his actual words or his actual deeds the end was death right he hanged himself he hanged himself so that was not repentance he was you can see in the fact that he just hanged himself the reality that what plagued him was the guilt, right? If there's true repentance, God removes the guilt. If there's not true repentance, the guilt stays. And if the guilt stays and Judas can't get rid of it, he has to make it stop. So his only recourse, his only option that he can come up with is to die. And to not live anymore with this kind of guilt and regret. So you see, it, it's not true repentance. We can see the same example in 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 10. Can somebody please read those verses for us? Thank you, sister. 
So already we can see there's repentance without regret, right? So these two things um, need to be separated, right? So repentance here is not uh, metamelomai, it's metanoeo. Metanoeo. And again, after. And then noeo is mind or thought. So it's this uh, change of mind, right? You could think of metamelomai as a change of feeling. Uh, and metanoeo as a change of mind. It's deeper. It's more significant. So we, we see here from Paul that Paul wrote a letter to Corinthians. It seems to be a letter. Um, some would say that there was a third letter that is a letter in between First and Second Corinthians. Uh, some would say that he's referring here back to 1 Corinthians. That was a little harsh at times or a little maybe, uh, or, or direct. Um, it seems, it seems uh, most commentators, most scholars would say that there's an extra letter that was not preserved for us. And so it is not scripture, but it was good for them. Uh, so there is this uh, uh, this this. One and a half Corinthians, you could say almost, uh, that Paul wrote to them. And he says that that letter caused them sorrow, caused them sorrow. So he wrote that letter. It was harsh. It was very direct. It was, it was cutting even. Um, and it caused them great sorrow as a church. But he says, even though that's true, I don't regret it. Now, in hindsight, he does not regret it. He does not, and this is the meta mellow mai, the weaker term. He doesn't, he hasn't uh, changed his feelings about what he wrote or how he wrote it. But he does say, I did regret it. So you can see he, he did have a change of feelings. Uh, maybe, oh, maybe I shouldn't have written it that way or written it that harshly or said those things. But that changed later on. Okay, so this is, we can already see this metamelomai, this regret is, is uh, more temporal, more, um, uh, it, it can change much easier. Uh, it's not as deep seated as true repentance as we're going to see. Because he says, I did regret it because I see that that letter caused you sorrow but only for a while. So what he's saying is, I regretted writing that letter that was harsh for a little while because it caused you sorrow for a little while. But now that's changed. That, that remorse, that regret has turned to rejoicing. And he's saying, I'm not rejoicing that you, because you were sad from my letter or sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. So he says, it, come, it turned out that uh, God used that letter to not just cause you sorrow and for you to stay there, but that you would be sorrowful over your sin and then change and repent. And he says, I don't feel bad about that. I don't feel bad about that. So he says, this sorrow led to repentance. This sorrow was according to the will of God. It was of God. So that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Because he says here, the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance. Okay, so sorrow, bad feelings, right? Sadness uh, that is from God, that is good, that is of God, it, it always produces repentance. And this repentance is a repentance without regret. What does he mean here? Well, this repentance is a change of mind, right? It is a turning from sin. Let 
when, a, when we call people to turn from their sin, we are saying that you turn from sin to God and you don't look back, right? And even as believers, when we fall into sin, when we fail and give into temptation, we are to repent and turn away from that sin. And, and that repentance, that turning away, is not to be stained with any amount of regret. What does that mean? That means that as I turn away from that sin, I don't have uh, remorse or regret about turning away from my sin. I don't second guess my repentance. It's a wholehearted repentance. It's a, it's a full turning of the full heart and mind away from sin and to God. And that is true repentance. That in my repentance, in my repentance to God, where I turn away from my sin and turn back to him, that I don't have a little piece of my mind saying, but, you know, that was fun. Or, but, you know, I had good reason to. No, that's repentance with regret. That's repentance with remorse that, you know, I, I, this isn't a full turning away. The repentance of God is without that kind of regret. And that's what leads to salvation. But he says the sorrow of the world produces death. And didn't we see that with Judas, right? He's a, he, he is a picture of the sorrow of the world, the regret of the world, the remorse of the world over sin. But it just stays there. There's no actual turning of the heart, of the mind. Now, what is repentance then? If that's not repentance, if it's not just feeling bad about sin, if it's not just regretting the consequences, I wish that it didn't turn out that way, um, then what is it? Well, repentance, well, number two, uh, we're getting into repentance is recognition of sin. Let me, let me read that definition that you have on your notes. Repentance is the change of the total mental disposition toward God and sin, resulting in the recognition of sin, remorse for sin, and repudiation of sin. So that should be on your notes. Is that on your notes at the top? Okay. So we're going to be referring to that because we're taking that definition apart, and that's the next three points. The next three, po three points are recognition of sin, remorse for sin, and repudiation of sin. Those are the three elements of uh, repentance. Recognition, remorse, and repudiation. Okay, so first of all, repentance is recognition of sin. Repentance is defined as a sincere change of the mind, of the intellect, towards sin. Romans one twenty one says, Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. We read this earlier. Uh, Ephesians 4, 17 and 18, I say and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So this is the state of the mind of the sinner. Romans 1, 21 no honor towards God, no thanks towards God. Their mind, that is the faculty of their minds, is futile, vain. Their heart, which, is, which overlaps our understanding of the mind, their foolish heart was darkened. So it's a, it's a fool's mind, it's a fool's heart, and that heart, that mind is darkened. It's darkened without perception of reality. So this is the state of everybody in sin. This is how the sinner 
views their sin. They think it's just fine. They see nothing wrong with it. And so therefore they don't turn to God. They see nothing wrong with their sin. Right? You can see, as we looked before, that in their minds, in their understanding, in their ignorance, in the hardness of heart, there's nothing wrong with sin. And so we saw in verse 19 that they go on in their sin, right? In, this, in the pursuit of their sensuality and their lusts, in their uh, wicked deeds. There's nothing, their, their mind sees nothing wrong with the sin. And they don't see it as sin. Yet, repentance, repentance is the recognition of sin. This is the intellectual element of repentance. It is a change of mind. It is a change of mind regarding sin. And we see this illustrated for us in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 5. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, in you only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So you can see, this is a... A model of repentance, right? How is David's uh, attitude towards sin? How does he view his sin? How about in verse 1 here? How does David view his sin? Right, so he calls them transgressions and he asks God to, to blot them out, right? Excuse me. Uh, how about verse 2 and 3 here? How does, what is David's attitude towards his sin? Yes. So there's this cleansing that's needed, right? So he needs to be washed from his sin, his iniquity. Right? So there is this awareness that there is something... I mean, just to put it simply, something dirty about sins. There is something wrong and staining, and as it, you could say, offensive about sin. So, his, so this is not the thinking of a sinner. The sinner sees nothing wrong with sin. The one who has been changed and is repentant sees something wrong with their sin. Sees it as needing to be washed away. I mean, you can see this in the way that he speaks, right? I mean, this is really the heart of it. For I know my transgressions. There is this awareness of sin. My sin is ever before me. There is this recognition. I see the sin for what it is. And it stands there before me, condemning me. And then, of course, verse 4 and 5, against you and you only have I sinned. There, there's this awareness that the sin is against God. That's really the main issue when it comes to sin. Uh, it's this awareness that sin is evil, right? And it's worthy of judgment. So this, there's this recognition. Don't you see that? This recognition of sin. I see it as for what it is, and I want it to be gone. Because I want you, God. So there's a change of mind towards God. There's a change of mind towards sin. There's a change of mind towards self, right? Uh, God is just. God is righteous. Cannot look upon sin. Uh, sin is evil, wicked, staining, and offensive towards God. And then I have sinned. I have sinned. And I am a sinner. And I am in need of forgiveness. I am in need to be washed. 
right? This is the change of mind. You're thinking differently about things when it comes to sin. Sin also is remorse over sin. Or excuse me, repentance is remorse over sin. Repentance is remorse uh, of sin. Now, I know that I, I said earlier that, you know, repentance is not remorse or regret. Repentance is not just remorse or regret. Remember, because there is a sorrow, a remorse that leads to true repentance, right? And so it is good to have that. So repentance is defined as a sincere change of mind or intellect and feeling or emotion. So a change of mind and intellect. And here, point three, a change of feeling or emotion towards sin. There is a remorse for sin, right? Back to our, our definition of repentance. We're looking at this now. Look, look at how the psalmist describes it. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Wow. <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? Uh, if there's anything to be anxious over in this world, it is your sin. <laughs> it is to, your sin should cause you great worry and concern. That's, that's anxiety, worry and concern. Um, so often, Christian, don't we get so anxious about other things? While we have this whole, you know, back room of sin, as it were, that we're not handing over to God. And we have these unconfessed sins. And we wonder why we struggle, struggle with things like anxiety at times and, or depression. Could it be that you are actually anxious over your sin? And you're worried about the consequences of your sin? What do we do with that? What do we do with that? We confess it, right? We lay it down on the floor before God. We just call sin, sin. We don't call it an addiction. We don't call it a weakness. We don't call it a momentary lapse. We don't call it um, uh, an illness. We just call sin, sin, and we lay it before God and say, I sinned. Please forgive me. Right? And, you'll, you, and, and as you develop that pattern, that healthy pattern, Christian, you will find greater victory over anxiety, maybe. You can see this is a very emotional verse, right? There's this anxiety over sin. The, the deepest thoughts and emotions of the mind Excuse me, the deepest thoughts of the mind have been changed. That's what we saw in the recognition of sin. So if we really see sin for what it is, that should do something to our emotions, right? Especially if we're the ones doing the sin. If I truly understand what sin is, and yet I do the sin, that, as a believer, that should wreck my emotions as it were when the deepest thoughts of the mind have been changed it is only normal for that change to be accompanied by strong emotions this is especially true in the course of a change of attitude towards spiritual matters some consider any emotional response to God inappropriate and offensive. But this is at best a distortion of truth and is simply not a valid treatment of Scripture. Uh, a couple examples. 2 Kings 22, verse 11 and 12, the king heard the words of the book of the law, right? This is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 
The, 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 the law of God, the word of God has been neglected for generations. Uh, this king comes and uh, is the beginning of reformation in the life of Israel. And so the king hears the words of the book that have been read to him. And the response to the reading of the law of God is that he tears his clothes. Then he commands uh, Hilkiah, the priest, ah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, uh, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Asaiah, the king, and the king's servants, saying, and it goes on to describe uh, the beginnings of Reformation, right? Let, let's, let's, let's uh, you know, uh, turn from our sin as a nation is what the king is going to enact. Now, uh, the Lord speaks to the king about that response. Notice how he describes it and a little later on in the passage. In verse 19, he says, um, Notice that he says, you have torn your clothes, right? So he says, because of your heart, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against his inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and you have wept before me. I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. And so we see in verse uh, 11 that it's just this short description of what happened. He heard the law read, and then he tore his clothes. But we're given a little insight here by God as to the state of his heart. Notice there's other things that happened before he ever tore his clothes. That is, you know, he, he, that, that's a sign of repentance, of, 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 of remorse and sorrow over sin. Uh, he says, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard, right? So when he heard the law, what was his response? Well, it was a tender heart and it was humility. Those are, those are inward, you could, for us, we would call it, those are heart responses, heart responses. It's a tender heart before God. That is a good thing, to have a tender heart before God. And I would argue that the more you grow in your walk, the more tender your heart is when it comes to these things. The more you will, you will hate sin, the more you will grieve over your sin. So if, if you are walking with the Lord, Christian, and God is blessing you with spiritual growth, but yet you, you look back and you say, I feel worse about my sin now more than I ever have. Does that mean I'm a worse sinner? Right? Well, apart from God, you are the worst of the worst, right? It doesn't get any worse. You can't get worse because you're totally depraved apart from God. But as a saint... A sinner saved by grace. The reality is that the closer you get to God, the more the emotion, the emotional response towards sin in, in that hate and regret and remorse over sin grows. Because the closer you get to this, a source of light, the closer you get in a dark room, the closer you get to a, to a light bulb, the more you can read the page that's before you. Right? So it is with God. The closer you get to God, the more you can actually see all your sins. You're not any more sinful. You just see it better because you're closer to God. And so that greater remorse, that greater uh, 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 feeling of wretchedness is actually right and good. And my, ta and my task and the task of the, of, the, of the church and your leaders is not to make you feel better as if you're not a sinner. It's to, it's to show you, yes, you're a great sinner. And your feelings over your sin are right and accurate. But it's because you're closer to God. And praise God that the more clearly you see your sin, the more clearly you can see the gospel of Jesus Christ that covers that sin. Preaching. James, James 4, 9 through 10. 
it's still in connection to, to showing you this, this, this emotional response in our repentance. He says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. And humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and then he will exalt you. Right? So this is us in our sin. This is us in our repentance. Our attitude before God. Yes, be miserable over your sin. Yes, mourn and weep over your sin. Don't laugh over your sin. Rather, mourn. Don't be joyful over your sin. Rather, be uh, consumed with gloom. And then you come to the Lord. You humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. You come to Him. You remind yourself of, of, of the gospel and of His love for you in the, in the cross. And then hit, let Him lift your head. Don't just brush off those bad feelings. That's what the world says to do. Oh, you, shouldn't, you should never feel bad. No, God says you should feel very bad about your sin. And if you don't feel bad about your sin, then it might show that, that there is no life there. Sorrow is not the main element of repentance, nor are tears its main indicator. So just because you feel bad, that's not repentance alone. Just because you cry, that's not repentance. The, de the degree of emotional response will vary from individual to individual. So it's going to look different between you and somebody else, right? That brokenness. But there will be some emotional reaction. How much that comes to the surface varies from person to person based on their personality. But in, in Psalm 51, we, we come back to this great example in Psalm 51 of repentance. Uh, all the aspects of, emotion, of the emotional element of repentance are present in Psalm 51 as well. Remorse, helplessness, humility, brokenness, loss of joy, contrition. Uh, look, look at it here. Make me to hear joy and gladness. This is... This is Basically saying, I don't have joy. I am not glad, right? He's asking God to give me that. And then he says, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. So again, he is without joy. But notice how he describes himself. The bones which God has broken. When we break bones, it hurts, right? So it is in our repentance. When we sin, and we recognize our sin, it hurts. And notice that it is God who has broken the bones, right? It is God where he, he, he can do that, can't he, Christian? He just, you are just giving into that sin and he will just break you. He will just break you and he'll drag you back. Right? It's like that, that one lost sheep where you know the, the, the shepherd has 99 and he goes after the one to bring back that one to the fold. That's us, right? When we are wandering off in our sin. And, and, and I can uh, imagine that there would be a shepherd going after that sheep and that sheep just still doesn't want to come back. And so, but, and that sheep wants to stay out there in the wilderness, in the dark, vulnerable. And so the shepherd knows that that sheep, left to himself, is just going to be devoured by the wolves. And so what does that shepherd do? You can imagine a shepherd breaking the bones of the, of the sheep. So you can't go any further. I'll put you on my back and I'll carry you back. That's the idea here. Is that God will break your bones to get you back. He will break you emotionally so that you will hate your sin more. Well, we got to keep on going. Lastly, repentance is, rec is rejection of sin. Repentance is is rejection of sin. There, you can read Psalm 51 for the rest of the emotional responses there. 
just as a quick reminder, just emotion is not enough. It is part of it, but it is, you could say, a lesser part of repentance. Uh, the main part of repentance are the first and third that we're looking at, the, the, the uh, recognition of sin, the change of mind, and then now the rejection of sin. So again, going back to that definition, repentance is, is the change of the total mental disposition toward God and sin resulting in recognition of sin, that we saw that, remorse for sin, that's the emotional, and now the repudiation of sin. Repudiation, or number four on your notes, rejection of sin. Rejection of sin. So repentance is defined as a sincere change of mind. That was, that was point two on your notes. The intellect, the, the, it's a change of feeling or emotion. That's point three on your notes there, the remorse. And then now it is a change of direction, change of direction, or the change of the will. And that's number four on your notes. So the three elements of repentance are the mind, feeling, and direction. Or you could state it, intellect, emotion, and will. All right. How do we see this? Uh, Jesus gives a parable here. What do you think? But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Uh, the, the man came to the second son and, the same, and said the same thing. And he answered and said, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his, did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward, so as to believe him. So what is he saying here? What he's saying is, He's drawing a parallel between the two sons, right? And he's saying, Pharisees, you are like that second son. Where uh, you say on the outside, we're children of God. We're children of our father Abraham. Uh, you, You do all the things that the law requires you on the outside, right? As far as, as what people hear from you, you're, you're, you're just a righteous people, Pharisees. But you don't obey God, he says, just like that second son. The second son, what he does is he says yes on the outside, but he says no, right, with his actions. You see that? That's the Pharisees. He says these prostitutes, these sinners and tax collectors, right, they seem like they are so far from God. They seem on the outside like that first son who at, at, first, uh, at first response is the rejection of God. That's the Gentiles, right? That's been the Gentile story up until this point. They have been a people who, you know, in response to God, just cast him aside. I will not. But now something has changed. They have regretted it, and then they they went, just like this son. There is this repentance, but then this action, you see. There is this, this action of going. So it's not just that they regretted it, that they repented, but we see the repentance in what they do, right? Just as the first son. At first, he was rebellious towards his father, but now he regretted it, and he changed what he did. It's not just, oh, I wish I hadn't said no to my father, and that's it. 
That's the worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is I, I should not have said no to my father. I wish I hadn't done that. Let me change now and obey him. That's repentance. That's repentance. It is a change of direction. It is an inward turning away from sin and towards God. This is the volitional, you could say, the volitional element of repentance. Luke, Luke uh, 15, 17. But when he came to his senses, this is speaking about the uh, prodigal son, right? Who just rejected his father, wished his father dead, said, just give me your money and, I'll, and, 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 and I don't want to have anything to do with you, basically. I wish you were dead. And I'll treat you just as if you were dead. And so he goes off, and he lives his life of sin, and he finds out it's all empty. But when he comes to his senses, he says, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. You see the beginnings of remorse. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as, as, one, hired, as one of your hired men. So you see this remorse, right? But that wasn't enough. Verse 20 goes on. So he got up. He got up and came to his father. You see. The sinner has to, as it were, get up and go to God. Can't just feel bad. It is an, it's a change of direction. Turning away from sin, turning towards God. It is only in this volitional element, this change of direction and, and, and mind, that the full meaning of meta noeo is expressed. The full meaning of this is expressed in the change of mind and the change of direction. I mean, this is what Christ expects. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You say you're a Christian, you say you repented from your sin and place your faith in God. Let me see it. That's what he says. Nothing changed when the apostles preached the gospel about Christ. They kept declaring to both it, those of Damascus first and also Jerusalem then throughout the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, what did they preach? That they should repent and turn to God. But let's see it, he says, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Because somebody can say I repented, somebody can say I turned to God, but yet live like they never have. You have to see it in their life. Otherwise, it, it clouds their profession of faith with uncertainty until there are deeds appropriate to repentance. Okay. So, in conclusion, repentance is defined as a sincere change of mind or intellect, feeling or emotion, and direction or will. Though repentance is required for salvation, it should never be considered, here's a big word, a meritorious work. That is a, an act of merit that you are earning salvation. Repentance is not our part in accomplishing our salvation. Don't think of it that way. It, it is our part, right? Because we do it. Repentance and faith, we do. But man is saved if he repents. Or man is saved when he repents. But he is not saved because he repents. It's a big difference. The grounds of your salvation is not your repentance. 
Your repentance is simply a response to God's regeneration, his change in you. You, you are only responding to that new life. You're not earning the new life. Okay? True repentance, lastly, never occurs without true faith, as we mentioned before. Both are connected in Scripture. Just one last verse. They themselves report to us what kind of reception we had with you, how you turned this is what receiving Christ, you know, the whole receiving Christ thing. This is what it looks like. It's not just mushy and, 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 and touchy. To receive, truly to receive Christ is to turn to God and turn from idols. Repentance and faith. Right? So it's a turning. It is a turning to God. And from idols. Faith, repentance. See? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So we've been looking at what does it look like? What does it mean to turn from idols? Next week we're going to look at what it means to turn to God. Right? So trust that you'll be with us next week. This is so helpful to know what God expects of you and know what you are going for, what you're aiming for in your evangelism as well. So I hope you'll be here next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, how clarifying it is, how detailed. Lord, we just have to study your word, give it some time, and it's so uh, revealing. It's so, uh, it illuminates all of life. And so, Lord, may we be a people of your word. May we love your word, study it, and, and gain much light from it for our lives and may you use us, Lord, to bring sinners to repentance. Speak the gospel through our lips, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. You're dismissed.